Chapter 18. For the first time in a long time, I slept all night without waking up. I was still asleep the next morning when Grandpa and Grandma drove up to our house. That was a very busy morning around our place. Both Mama and Grandma were giving me orders at the same time. Don't forget that. Bring this. Hurry now. We don't want to miss that train. I never saw anything like it. The last part was the worst. Mama, Daisy, and Grandma were all bawling at the same time. I didn't think Mama would ever turn loose of Papa. Daisy was bawling and kissing everything that got close to her. She kissed Papa four or five times. She tried to kiss me, but I got away from her. She caught Rowdy and kissed him right between the eyes. The last thing I put in the buckboard was Daisy's old crutch. I cried a little when I saw them disappear down the road. Papa and I took care of Grandpa's store that day, and I made myself sick. I ate so much candy. By late evening, I was the sickest boy in those Ozark Hills. I was still sick when I went to bed that night. The next morning, while we were having breakfast, Papa said, Now that Mama and Daisy are gone, things are going to be a little different. You and I will have to take care of everything. If you can do the cooking and take care of things around the house, I'll take care of the fields. How does that sound to you? It sounds fine to me, Papa, I said. Do you think you can do it, Papa asked. Oh, sure, Papa, I said. I won't have any trouble with the cooking. I've watched Mama do that a thousand times. Papa laughed. I don't know, he said. You may find there's more to cooking than you think. Nah, Papa, I said. I won't have any trouble with it. Every time you come in from the field, I'll have some food on the table, just like Mama does. To have a little company, I propped the kitchen door open so Rowdy could come and go. This pleased him very much because only on special occasions was he allowed in the house. I figured that this was a very special occasion. With Mama's apron tied around me and, and humming a happy tune, I got started. The first thing I tried to cook was some beans. I got a pot and filled it about two-thirds full with beans. I poured in a little water, dropped in a chunk of salt pork, and set it on the stove. Then I peeled three potatoes and sliced them. I set a skillet on the stove, waited until it was hot enough to fry nails, and dried the potatoes in a scoop of hog lard in it. While the beans and potatoes were cooking, I figured that I'd make some flour gravy. All this time, I was still humming that happy little tune. It didn't take long to find out that I knew absolutely nothing about cooking. I was setting the table when things started happening. First it was the beans. They hadn't been boiling very long when they started crawling out of the pot as if they were alive. In no time I had beans all over the stove and all over the kitchen floor. Some even fell off the stove into Mama's wood box. Then the potatoes went crazy. They started burning and smoking at the same time. Before I knew it, the house was full of smoke. I opened every door and the window to let it out. Rowdy got scared, ran outside, and crawled under the porch. When I tried to pour the gravy out of the skillet into a bowl, it wouldn't pour. It just plopped out like a pancake. I had no trouble getting rid of my messes. Our chickens and sloppy ann, our hog, would eat anything. I tried to get Rowdy to come back in the house so I'd have someone to talk to, but he wouldn't do it. I threatened to whip him, but it did no good. When Papa came in from the field for his dinner, he said, Boy, I'm hungry. What are we going to eat? Papa, I said, I'm afraid I'm not much of a cook. Everything I put on the stove either boiled over or burned up. There must be more to this cooking than I thought there was. <clears throat> Papa laughed. I was afraid of that, he said, but don't let it bother you. We'll make out all right. I'll help you with the cooking. For dinner, we had some cornbread that Mama had baked, sweet milk, honey, and butter. That was all. We made out all night, but it wasn't easy. Papa couldn't cook any better than I could. I would have starved to death if it hadn't been for Grandma. About every two or three days, I'd pay her a visit, and she would fill me up. The mail buggy made one trip from Tahlequah to Grandpa's store each week. We never knew what day it would come. Each time the buggy came, there were two letters from Mama, one for Papa and one for Grandma and Grandpa. Papa and I would read Mama's letters over and over. Mama wasn't very happy about staying in the big city. She told us how lonesome she was and how much she missed us. Daisy was getting along fine. They had operated on her leg, and she had a cast on it. The doctor told Mama that he felt sure the operation had been successful. If everything went as they thought it would, Daisy would need her old crutch anymore. They wouldn't know for sure until they took the cast off. 
I thought it would be fun with no one around but Papa and me. There was no one to give me orders or tell me what to do, but the fun didn't last very long. I began to miss Mama and Daisy. The days got longer and longer, and the nights were almost unbearable. By the end of the third week, it seemed as if a gloomy silence had settled all around our home. Everything seemed to have changed. Our chickens had all but stopped laying. We were getting about half as many eggs as we had been. Sally Gooden had dropped off in her milk until she was barely wetting the bucket. One day I went to get a bucket of water and almost cried when I noticed that our well was going dry. Papa tried to explain these changes by saying it was time of year when everything around the farm changes. Summer was almost gone and fall was coming. It happened every year and it wasn't anything to worry about. The way I was feeling, I wasn't worrying about our farm. Right then, I didn't care what happened to it. I was lonesome. I wanted Mama and Daisy to come home. <clears throat> Rowdy didn't help at all. He had stopped following me around and didn't have any more bounce to him than an Ozark flint rock. He couldn't understand why I didn't go prowling anymore. As the days passed, Papa started moping around as if he didn't have any life left in him. Some nights he would sit in his rocker on the porch and smoke his pipe until way in the night. It got so bad that sometimes he would go all day and not say one word to me. It was worse around Grandpa's store. He got so grumpy he couldn't get along with himself, much less anyone else. In the middle of the fourth week, we got a letter from Mama that cheered us up for a few days. Mama said that the doctor had taken off the cast of Daisy's leg. The operation had been a success and Daisy was learning to walk. She said that Daisy was walking all over the hospital. After hearing this, Papa and I felt pretty good for a few days. Then that lonely feeling crept in on us again. It seemed to be 10 times worse than it had been before. Six long, miserable weeks went by. It got so still around our home, it gave me a scary feeling. I went out to find my way to find things to do. I kept the weeds hold out of Mama's garden. I cleaned the barn. I swept the floor in our house so many times it was a wonder I didn't wear out the floorboards. I couldn't forget the little mare. There was hardly a day went by that I didn't think of her. It was the dreams that hurt worst of all. I would dream that I would hear her nickering, but I couldn't see her. When I would see her, I couldn't put my hands on her. She was always just out of reach. In ghostly slow motion, I could see her running with mane and tail blowing in the breeze. Sometimes I would try so hard to catch her, but I never could quite make it. Oh, I'd get close, so close that I could almost touch her with my hand, and then I'd wake up. It hurt, oh, how it hurt. One day, about the middle of the afternoon, I took a broom and a bucket of water and walked up to Daisy's playhouse. I gave it a good sweeping, and I watered all of her flowers. I noticed that the wind and rain had unwrapped some of the tinfoil from the grapevine cross. I was rewrapping the cross on the cross when I thought of the old man of the mountains. With tears in my eyes, I knelt in front of the cross and asked him to help me. Old man of the mountains, I said, I know you're here somewhere. Daisy says... You're always around. She put that, you see, she says that you see and hear everything that goes on in these hills. I hope you hear me today. Please send Mama and Daisy home. I miss them so much. I don't think I can stand it anymore. If you do this, one thing for me, I promise to be good for as long as I live. The old man of the mountains must have decided that I did need help. The very next day, something wonderful happened. Pop and I were sitting on the porch of our home in the twilight of evening. Rowdy was lying at my side. Thousands of lightning bugs had just started their flickering dance. They looked like tiny flashlights going on and off, on and off. In one of the big red oaks, a small screech owl started his eerie twitter. Across the river at the Mose Hobbs farm, an old milk cow was mooing and an old hound was baying in his deep voice. Down in the river bottoms, an old hooty howl started singing his hoot owl song to the silent night. I saw when Rowdy raised his head, pricked up his ears, and looked down the road. Papa, I said, somebody's coming. Papa stirred in his chair and said, what makes you think someone's coming? I don't hear anything. I don't either, Papa, I said, but Rowdy does. <clears throat> Papa looked at Rowdy. I believe he does hear something, he said. Then we heard the jingling of harnesses 
and the fast popping of horses' hoofs. Papa got up from his chair. He said, I wonder who it could be this late in the evening. It was Grandpa. In a cloud of dust, his buckboard pulled up in front of the house. Grandpa started talking as he got out of it. I've been trying to get down here ever since the mailman came, he said, but I couldn't get away from the store. I never saw so many people. He came over and handed Papa a letter. They're coming in tomorrow, he said, on the noon train. That's what she said in our letter. Papa never said a word. He turned and walked into the house. Grandpa and I followed him. Papa opened the letter. In the glow of our coal oil lamp, he started reading it aloud. The letter was short. Mama said that she and Daisy would be on the noon train and wanted us to meet them. She said there were a lot of things she wanted to tell us, but it would be better to wait and let us see for ourselves. <clears throat> Grandpa said, if you're busy with your farm work, I'll be glad to go in and pick them up. No, we'll go in, Papa said. I think it would do us good to get away from here for a day. I knew that I was going to ball, so I went to my room and lay down on the bed. With my face buried in my pillow, I said, thanks, old man of the mountains. Thank you very much, and I'll keep my promise. I didn't sleep very well that night, and I kept waking up. Papa must not have slept at all. Every time I woke up, I could hear him stirring around in the house. The next morning, Papa was up before daylight. He had opened the door and let Rowdy in the house. Rowdy came flying into my room and jumped right up in the middle of my bed. I tried hiding under the covers, but it did no good. With his paws, Rowdy dug the quilts off me and started licking my face. I put my arms around him and said, Boy, you better be glad that Mama's not here. She'd wear the broom out on you. In the kitchen, Papa was chuckling as he built a fire in the cook stove. All the time, Papa and I were doing the chores that morning. Rowdy stayed so close to me I could barely walk. Several times, I almost stepped on him. Even while we were eating breakfast, he sat where he could look right in my face. He wiggled, and he twisted. He whimpered, and he whined. <clears throat> the old tail was going in all directions. Papa laughed and said, What's the matter with that old hound? He sure is acting funny. He knows we're going someplace, I said, and he's begging me to let him go with us. Papa said, Why, well, we'll have to take him. We couldn't leave him here all alone. He'd die a thousand deaths. Just be sure that we have a rope with us. Watch this, Papa, I said. Looking at Rowdy, I said, It's all right, boy. You can go with us. Rowdy was so pleased he had a running fit. He bounded into the front room, made a U-turn, came flying back through the kitchen and out the door. He ran all the way around the house and came back in. He sat down, raised his old head, and bawled. I thought everything in the house would come down. Papa and I laughed and laughed. That was the first good laugh we'd had since Mom and Daisy had gone away. While I was doing the dishes, Papa hitched our mules to the wagon. Both of us put on clean overalls and shirts. I went out to the watering trough and washed my feet a little, but not very much. All the way to town, Papa kept our old mules to stepping. When we got to the depot, Papa drove around behind it and tied the team to the hitching trail rail. While he was taking care of the team, I took the rope and tied it to Rowdy's collar. A lot of people were milling around the depot. They didn't pay much attention to Rowdy and me. Oh, some of them looked at us and nodded their heads. A few spoke, but, but that was all. Papa walked over to where the group of men were talking and joined in on the conversation. <clears throat> While Papa and the men were talking, Rowdy and I took a walk along the track. That was the first time I had walked a steel rail of a railroad track. It was fun. Not to be outdone, Rowdy got up on the rail and walked it too. Rowdy did all right with his rail walking, but I didn't do too well. It's not easy to walk on a rail if you're holding onto a rope with a hound dog tied on the end of it. Believe me, it's pretty hard to do. Rowdy and I were a good way down the track when I heard the train whistle in the distance. It was coming from the other direction. We hurried back to the depot. <clears throat> I had never seen a train before, and I was all excited about seeing my first one. The track made a bend about 500 yards from the depot. I glued my eyes to the bend and held my breath. I waited and watched. The rail started clicking and the ground started trembling. With its bells ringing and black smoke rolling, the engine came around the bend. <clears throat> when Rowdy saw the big black noise of the engine coming toward him, he got scared. He tried to get between my legs and I wouldn't let him. I was scared too, and I didn't want a hound dog and a rope round around my legs if I decided to have a runaway. Rowdy must have gotten a scared he didn't know what he was a doing. 
With every hair on his back standing straight up, he growled and showed his teeth. He ran out to the end of the rope and started to ball at the train. Behind me, I heard someone say, If that boy would turn that old hound loose, I think he'd tie into that train. All around me, people started to laugh. Just before the train got to the depot, it whistled. Oh, it jumped out of my britches. I had never heard anything like it in my life. <clears throat> that whistle was so much for Rowdy. With his tail between his legs, he came scooting back and tried to get between my legs again. Rowdy, I said in a quavering voice, if you don't sit down and behave yourself, I'm going to whip you. I didn't mean that, I said, but I was so scared I had to say something. Jarring the ground with its big pounding wheels, the engine chugged by us. It pulled past the depot a little way with steam hissing and brakes squeaking and stopped. A pasture coach was right in front of us. For several seconds, for several seconds, a silence settled over the people waiting on the depot platform. All I could hear was the hissing breath of the engine. The door of the coach opened and a black man with a small stool in his hand stepped out. He was wearing a dark green uniform and a round, hard, top cap with a long bill. That was the first black man I'd ever seen and I couldn't take my eyes off him. He must have noticed me staring at him and as he set the stool down on the platform, he looked at me and then at Rowdy. With a friendly smile on his face, he said, will that hound tree anything? I swallowed and said, yes, sir, he'll tree anything. The smile spread all over the black man's face. His white teeth flashed. He said, that's the kind of dog to have. When I was a boy, I had an old hound just like him. I still remember that old dog. We had a lot of fun together. I liked the black man. He was so friendly, and I could tell that he liked boys and dogs. <clears throat> Two cowboys were the first ones off the train. They were carrying their saddles over their shoulders. In a loud voice, someone in the crowd said, Hey, Larry, how'd the rodeo go? Larry laughed and said, It went all right for me, but old Henry here, he didn't do so good. He got bucked off everything he got on. Henry said, If you'd drawn the buckers I drew... You would have been in the air so much you would have sprouted wings. Everyone around roared with laughter. Then two drummers got off. Each one was carrying two suitcases. No one said a word to them. <clears throat> the next person to get off was a big, stout woman. She had about a dozen kids bunched up behind her. It sounded like every one of them was bawling. The woman was jerking and shoving kids and giving orders. Then I saw Mom and Daisy at the door of their coach. Mama was carrying her suitcase in one hand and Daisy's old crutch in the other. She small, saw me and smiled. Tears flooded her eyes. Mama didn't waste any time getting off the coach and coming to me. She dropped the suitcase and the crutch, threw her arms around me and kissed me. She squeezed me so tight I could hardly get my breath. Then Mama turned me loose and with a low, choking sob, she went right into Papa's arms. I never saw so much hugging and kissing between Mama and Papa. <clears throat> Daisy was the last one to get off the train. She was still standing in the door of the coach and was looking at me. She had her suitcase with her and some bundles. I'd never seen such a warm, tender smile on her face. Her blue eyes were as bright as a bluebird flying into the sun. Two big tears were sliding slowly down her cheeks. The tears stopped about halfway down and held there as if some invisible force. I let my eyes travel from Daisy's face down to that old crippled leg. I sucked in a mouthful of air and stared. I just couldn't believe it. Daisy wasn't crippled anymore. I kept staring from one leg to the other. If I had known which one had been crippled, I never would have been able to guess. There was no difference in either leg. <clears throat> As I stood there looking at Daisy, I knew that I would never regret giving up my pony. It was all worth it. My little sister wasn't a cripple anymore. Daisy must have seen that I was staring at her leg. Very slowly, she raised her foot and wiggled it. Never before had my little sister been able to move her foot like that. To let her know that I understood and was happy for her, I smiled and nodded my head. With no limp at all, Daisy came down the steps and over to me. She stopped about three feet from me, set her suitcase down, and piled the bundles on top of it. For a second, she stood there, looking at me. I could see the tears glistening in her eyes. Then she jumped, just kind of jumped, and wrapped her arms around me. I didn't know my little sister was so strong. She was hugging me so tight, and her small arms felt like steel bands around my neck. Jay Berry, she whispered, I love you so very much. I won't ever forget what you did for me. Then she kissed me right on the mouth. I felt the blushing heat as it crawled up my neck and spread all over my face. I love you too, I said in a low voice. 
but you didn't have to kiss me like that, not right here in front of all these people. Daisy smiled and said, I don't care what anyone thinks. You're my brother, and I'll kiss you anytime I want. <clears throat> I wanted to argue with Daisy about that, but I didn't think it was a good time to start an argument. Papa came over and, I, and hugged and kissed Daisy. It was the first time in my life I saw tears in his eyes. Just then, the deep voice of a hound dog rang out over the depot platform. In his own way, Rowdy was telling the whole wide world that he was a happy hound. The family was together again. All around us, people were started laughing. I was feeling so good that I laughed a little too. We were putting the suitcases and bundles in our wagon when Papa looked at Mama and said, Why did you bring Daisy's old crutch on? She doesn't need it now. I know, Mama said as she climbed to the wagon seat, but I don't care. I brought it home anyway. I want it hung on the wall in our home where I can see it every day and be thankful. Papa never said a word as he laid Daisy's crutch in the wagon, but I could tell by the look on his face that he was thankful too.